Hi, my name is Greg Burkhart, Director of Safety and Training here at the AGC of Northwest Ohio. Today I'd like to talk about tools, hand tools, and power tools. Items that we use on a daily basis on job sites. Some fatal facts to start off with. A 22-year-old young man was standing on the wrong side of a concrete form. Uh, when his coworker tried to attach the form to the frame for the concrete form, and when he used a powder actuated tool, he missed the form itself, went through the plywood and struck 27 feet away, struck the young 22 year old in the head and killed him instantly. So, Although power tools, like I said, are used on a daily basis, power and hand tools, we use them on a daily basis at work, um, they're part of our everyday lives. We don't think anything of picking up a tool at home and using it. And I think when we do that, we become complacent and we think that since we can use that tool at home, that there's no way that this tool can hurt us in any way, shape or form. When in fact, that is not the case. Uh, any tool you pick up, whether it's a hand tool or a power tool, if it's not used properly, if it's not checked before we use it, can seriously hurt us or in that 22-year-old young man's life, uh, it can kill you. It can kill you. So we need to check them. Um, a lot of us bring our tools to work. We walk over to our pickup truck and we take our tools out and we do a job for our employer. Uh, even the OSHA standard says that you must inspect your tools, whether they're your tools or your employer's tools, prior to using them that day. And the reason is um, because they can hurt you, they can even kill you if not used properly. So what we're going to talk about today is we're going to identify various types of tools, hand tools and power tools. Uh, we're going to describe some of the hazards involved with using those hand and power tools and guarding. Uh, far too many times I've seen on job sites where we have overridden the guards that protect us from the blades or from material that's flying off of the blades uh, that's there to protect us, to keep us safe. Uh, we're going to talk about some safe operating procedures to make sure that we are safe. We're going to talk about those guards, uh, PPE, things like that to keep us safe from um, getting hurt while on the job site. And we're also going to talk a little bit about employer requirements. So just some of the tools that we talk about, some of the hand tools that can hurt us. Uh, it's, we use them on a daily basis. Hammers, Allen wrenches, screwdrivers, pry bars, crescent wrenches, um, chisels, screwdrivers, all this stuff we use on a regular basis. Do we inspect it? Do we take a good look at it to make sure that it's not going to break when we're trying to use it? Um, I've got Phillips screwdrivers at home that need to be thrown out, but I'm just too lazy to do it. Uh, do I inspect it? Yeah, I always take a look at it to make sure it's going to do what I want it to do. And I still use it. Um, that's not the way to do things. We need to inspect them, make sure that they're going to work properly the way we want them to work um, so that they don't slip off what we're trying to do and hurt us, whether it's our hand or even hurt somebody else. Uh, different types of power actuated tools that we're going to talk about and that we use on a regular basis at the job site or even, like I said, even at home. Uh, electrical, uh, pneumatic, liquid fuel, that's our uh, gas powered weed whackers and chainsaws, uh, augers, uh, things like that. Hydraulic, uh, some of the problems with hydraulic tools and how they can hurt us. And then also the powder actuated tools. And the powder actuated tools are just that, they are fueled by gunpowder. And those we are going to talk about, those are and can be very deadly. Some of the hazards uh, that we come across um, when it comes to power and hand tools. Uh, struck by hazards, what are we struck by? Are we, is the tool breaking? Is that gonna strike somebody, the hammer head that flies off and hits somebody, the chisel, that has a mushroom top on it that uh, when we hit it, we hit it incorrectly and parts of that fly off, maybe hit somebody in the eye or whatever. Uh, but these are the things, if we inspect our tools on a regular basis, that this stuff will not happen. Electrical hazards. 
We all know that uh, anything with a cord, electricity, 120 volts coming right out of the wall, that can kill us. It's not the volts that kill us, it's the amps. 75 milliamps, some of these tools draw upwards of 12 to 15 amps to get started. So we're talking 75 milliamps, a fraction of what it takes to start these tools and get them moving for us. And we're gonna talk about some caught in between hazards too. And those are simply hazards where uh, we get pinched in between the um, equipment that we're using and a stationary object, a wall or a pole, uh, another vehicle, things like that. So these are all just some of the hazards uh, for hand and power tools. Uh, when we use power tools, such as a saw, we're, we're applying high speed to a piece of wood, a piece of concrete, a block or something like that. We are changing the physical characteristics of that material. We're changing that from a nice big piece of, piece of wood to sawdust. Are we inhaling that sawdust? Is it treated lumber? Are we inhaling those chemicals? Uh, cutting brick and block. Silica, when we apply a saw, we're creating silica dust. Are we breathing that in? Worse yet, is other people breathing that in? Are we protecting ourselves and are we making sure that the people around us are protected or at a distance so they're not um, exposed to some of these materials? And even the noise, hearing protection, are, are we wearing hearing protection? And are we notifying other people that they need to be wearing hearing protection in the area that we're working when we're using saws, um, silica, concrete cutting saws, or chainsaws, or something like that? So it's not just about us. It's about the people that we're working around too, protecting them also. Slips and trips, the cords, um, electrical cords, are we putting those in areas where we're not going to trip over while we're using that? Some of the things we wear to protect ourselves, if we're wearing proper PPE, I know proper PPE um, is comfortable. It should be comfortable. But when we're wearing it, can we see everything we need to see? Does that create a tripping hazard with the mask that maybe we have to wear um, or the safety glasses, things like that? We just have to be aware of the, uh, our surroundings and make sure that our surroundings are clean and clutter-free when we're using these materials. And we're using saws, um, sharp edges, protruding objects. Uh, remember, sharp, keeping our tools sharp is much safer than trying to use a dull tool. I know that doesn't, people don't understand that, but when you're using a sharp tool, you keep that tool sharp. It works easier. You don't have to work so hard to draw that knife across the, a dull knife across the board um, is harder to pull. A sharp knife across the board or whatever is easier to pull, and uh, it's, it's just safer to use that way. Um, using the wrong tool for a job, pry bars, screwdrivers. Probably the two most popular things. We're using a screwdriver as a pry bar, and uh, a pry bar as a screwdriver. I don't know if that's possible, but uh, I suppose people probably do try that. Uh, I've seen people using hammers or using uh, wrenches, whether it's a crescent wrench or a pipe wrench, as a hammer. They grab the first thing they can find to pound that nail, bend that nail over, whatever the case may be. Um, it, it's it's a hazard. It could break off. It could um, hurt somebody, it could hurt you. This is not about OSHA violations right now. This is actually doing the right thing and keeping not only yourself safe, but also your fellow workers safe. Damaged and broken tools. When we see a hammer that's got a broken handle, when we see a dull chisel, a dull knife, uh, anything like that, it's time to get rid of it. It's time to get it replaced. It's time to find yourself one that will not shatter uh, while you're using it. And like I said, hurt yourself or even hurt somebody else in the, in the area, in the vicinity, in your work area. Spark producing tools near flammable sources. Uh, this is a, um, I see this all too often. We don't think about grabbing that tool uh, to grind something down, to make a cut. A lot of companies use steel studs. 
are we aware of where all those sparks are flying? Um, I've seen videos out there where people are not aware of that and uh, somebody is using a um, toluene or something that's flammable for a cleaner or something to that effect and they're not minding, they don't, they're just not thinking where those sparks are going and, uh, and flames fire has started because of that. So please be aware of that. Uh, spark producing tools are very dangerous. Um, if we're working on a second or third floor of a building, we're cutting something. If there's holes in the floor that shouldn't be there, but they're there, those sparks can go down to the next level. We don't know what's going on down at that level below us. Uh, somebody could get hurt very easily, very quickly. It does not take much to get severe burns, uh, to, for us to get severely burnt when it comes to uh, flash fire. Uh, guarding, like I said before, guarding of the tools. Um, far too often we take the guards off, especially table saws, um, because it's obnoxious to have that guard there. It is there for a reason. It is there to protect you, to keep your fingers safe. Remember, we want to come to work with 10 fingers and 10 toes and go home with 10 fingers and 10 toes. So make sure that things are properly guarded. Grounded equipment. Now, a lot of people, when they use their um, uh, electrical tools, uh, do they inspect the, um, the wire to make sure that the grounding pin is still there? Uh, the cord, I should say. Is the cord still good? Is it uh, intact? Is it tattered or anything like that? We should be inspecting all of this stuff prior to use each and every day. And remember, a lot of these manufacturers, before you open up your tool and use it, read the instructions. I know we don't do it, I am certain of that, but in there we'll tell you what proper personal protective equipment you should be wearing when you use these tools. And I'd like to stress that a lot of this stuff I'm talking about is for personal safety. It's not, uh, we shouldn't even be talking about OSHA. But one of the things that OSHA will do is if somebody seriously gets hurt, um, they will come in. Remember, they have six months to issue their citation. Uh, if it has something to do with a hand or a power tool, they will look in the instructions. And in that, those instructions, if it says uh, proper PPE must be worn, they give examples, hearing protection, eye protection, gloves, whatever the case may be, and it wasn't worn, uh, they will cite you for not using the tool properly. So keep that in mind, um, but like I said, I like to talk about all this stuff as personally somebody not getting hurt, and that's the way it should be. We should approach all of this so that we use all of these tools safety. We, safely. We inspect them prior to each use. We use them safely, and we go home with, come to work with 10 fingers, 10 toes, and go home with 10 fingers and 10 toes. So talking about guarding. Uh, motions, rotating, in running nip points such as belt sanders, uh, reciprocating saws, things like that. These are all the things that must have guards on them. Cutting, punching, shearing, and bending, things like that must be guarded. The operation must be guarded so as we do not get hurt. The guard is supposed to protect us from moving parts uh, such as the uh, circular saw. We have a guard on there that retracts as you push through the wood. And when you are done cutting, um, the guard automatically retracts and covers up the blade. Um, we want to, like I said, cover up that point of operation, the in running points, rotating parts, things like that. Our circular saws, our uh, right angle grinders. Um, this protects us from not only the saw blade itself, but also from flying chips and sparks keeps us safe, uh, abrasive wheels and cutting blades. And um, we wanna make sure that all of these guards are in place and working properly. This is all part of our inspection prior to us using that saw or that cutter for the day. Um, and as far as removing the guards, um, like I said, OSHA will come in and do a, um, they'll do an inspection they, if, if they get called in and they will look at the instruction manual and see if that guard was removed, if a handle was removed. On a lot of these right angle grinders, people remove the handles to get them into a tighter place. Uh, you can't, we can't do it. It's, it's there for a reason, it's to keep us safe. It is to keep us safe. Um, even our 
confined space equipment, blowers, things like that. We want to make sure that all of that stuff is guarded so that we can't stick our hand in there or anything can fly in there. Um, you get something to fly in there to get sucked up in there and gets blown out the other end, that could be deadly and dangerous too. So when it comes to general hand and power tool safety, we always want to keep our tools clean and well maintained. And this starts with inspecting them. Give them a quick five to 10 second inspection prior to each and every use. Not just when you get them out of your truck in the morning or you get them out of the tool, tool trailer in the morning, but prior to each and every use. You know, did you use it uh, to cut wood uh, five minutes ago and that hit something? Uh, hit a nail? Did you damage the blade? Did you damage the saw? It should be inspected on a regular basis, not just every day, but on a regular basis prior to each and every use. Uh, always use the right tool the right way it's supposed to be used. Like I said, the screwdriver as a screwdriver, the pry bar as a pry bar, the hammer as a hammer, the pipe wrench as a pipe wrench, and so on and so forth. And like I said before, please make sure you follow manufacturer's instructions. I know as guys, as construction workers, as even ladies, we do not do that. We grab the tool, we think we know everything about the tool, we take it, we start using it right away. Where do the instructions go? They go right in the box, right in the garbage, uh, and, we, and we shouldn't. And as far as proper PPE, make sure that even looking at uh, the owner's manual will tell you exactly what type of PPE you should be wearing on this stuff. Practice good housekeeping, like I said before. Make sure that we clean up after ourselves. Um, we cutting wood, uh, making a mess. Let's pick the wood up so we're not tripping over it, um, making even a bigger mess. We trip and fall. Uh, I know falls are the number one killer for construction workers, and it's not even falls from heights that kill people. It's falls from the working level. We fall over backwards. Uh, we fall forward, we fall sideways, whatever the case may be, and on our way down, we may hit something on the way down. Uh, every job site should be well lit. Uh, if not, make sure we have enough light to see what we're doing. And like I said, inspect our tools. Remove them from service if they need to be removed from service. Uh, it, it just doesn't make any sense to use a tool that is um, not working properly. Uh, it could be very dangerous, it could be even deadly to not only yourself, but think about the people that you're working around also, and also make sure that all of our tools are sharp. Uh, power tools, before we work, do any type of work on a power tool, if we have to change a blade, whatever the case may be, we must unplug it. Uh, we, we don't talk about lockout, tag out so much in the construction industry because we just don't do it, um, but that is a form of lockout, tag out. When we unplug that, we take that plug and we step on it, and we do whatever we need to do to make sure we have control of that plug so that somebody can't plug that tool in while we're working on it or whatever, but uh, make sure that when we are working on tools, especially the tools that are powered by electricity, that we have complete control over that cord and that it is unplugged. Uh, keep people safe at a, at a, working, a safe working distance from us. Uh, there again, they may not be wearing the same PPE that we are. Are they wearing safety glasses? Are you cutting metal? Are you throwing sparks? Um, keep the people away. And quite frankly, the people that see the sparks that are walking through the area, um, take an extra five seconds to walk around that area. You don't need to be walking through where sparks are flying, where metal is flying, where wood chips are flying or anything like that. Uh, make sure you secure your work, hold it down with a vise, have somebody help you hold it down. But uh, moving pieces, moving parts that you're trying to cut, that is, that is very, very dangerous. Uh, avoid accidental startups. Um, make sure that before you plug the tool in that the uh, trigger is not being held open or that it is not in the open position so that it does start up while you're plugging it in and you're not anywhere near the tool. Um, make sure the guards are on, like I said, correctly. Make sure the guards are on correctly and safely. Uh, maintain good footing and balance. Uh, like I said, watch where you're standing. Uh, make sure you do have your footing in a, a solid area. It's not slippery. There's no oil. Uh, there's no other tools or no other scrap pieces of wood, metal, or whatever. Uh, make sure that you have proper footing. Uh, and wear proper clothing for the task. Uh, remember, a lot of these are uh, rotating parts, drill bits, things like that. Uh, jewelry, 
bracelets, necklaces, long hair, um, scarves, things like that should not be worn around rotating parts. Um, very easily you can get caught up in that uh, and it can hurt or it can even kill you. And keep talking about safeguard open or exposed parts, but all of this stuff, um, just please be safe. Um, watch the guards, make sure the guards are working in proper working order. Electrical tools, if you find a tool that is damaged, tag it, take it out of service, um, give it to the supervisor, whatever, however they, the company policy is as far as getting rid of the tools. Make sure we do have a training program in place that we do see a tool that is tagged, do not use must be repaired, that everybody understands that that's exactly what that's there for. It doesn't mean that Bob can't use it, but Joe can. Um, it means that nobody uses that tool, nobody at all. Um, we protect against shock. We use that by, or we can do that by ground fault circuit interrupters, which should be used on every tool on every job site. Uh, the standard specifically spells out that ground fault circuit interrupters be used with temporary wiring extension cords are considered temporary wiring. So even if you don't use it with an extension cord, you should still use a ground fault circuit interrupter with your tools. And never re remove that third prong, that third pin on your, on your cord, the tool. That is a grounding tool. Electricity seeks the easiest path to ground. You wanna make sure that it is through that tool, through that wire, through that grounding prong and not through you. Because like I said, it takes 12 to 15 amps to get those tools moving. It takes 75 milliamps, much, much lower to stop your heart. Like I said, GFCI, ground fault circuit interrupters, and those should be tested on a regular basis to make sure that those are working properly. Also, they need to be stored properly and if you don't use a ground fault circuit interrupter, there's another program called an Assured Equipment Grounding Program that all companies must use if they do not use ground fault circuit interrupters. It is a long and lengthy program. Most of our contractors do use ground fault circuit interrupters because the Assured Equipment Grounding Program is much more difficult to follow than just expecting a ground fault circuit interrupter, plugging it in and using it. At no time do we carry our tools by the cord. We don't unplug them from a distance. We walk up to the plug itself. We pull the plug from the wall and we unplug it the wall from, we unplug the cord from the wall like that. Our abrasive wheels and tools, uh, they're all always equipped with guards. You get about 30 degrees of opening on your grinders so you are able to use your tool. Um, that little work platform there in front of the grinder should be a one eighth of an inch away from the grinding wheel. You should test your grinding wheels prior to each use. Uh, it's if for all you old guys, I think you understand when you were playing baseball, you'd take a wooden baseball and you tap it on the ground to make sure that it wasn't cracked. Uh, this is basically the same thing. You take a wooden handled tool and you tap a ring, your grinding ring, and it, you should get a nice metallic sound out of it. It shouldn't sound dull and dead, uh, much like your bat would have, uh, your wooden bat. Uh, for you young guys that have aluminum bats, I got nothing. Follow manufacturer's recommendations for operating speeds. Um, we've actually taken tools off of job sites that have the wrong grinding wheel on it for the speed of the tool. Uh, that's crazy those tools will explode and do a lot of damage when those wheels fly apart. So not only to you, but also to everybody around you is in danger if one of those wheels blows apart. Uh, we wanna make sure that when we accelerate, when we use these wheels, um, bring it up to speed, but before we bring it up to speed, we wanna to step to the side, uh, let those wheels, let those grinding wheels, anything like that, even saws, things like that, bring them up to speed, uh, let them come up to speed while you're standing off to the side. That way, if they do fly apart, uh, you won't get hurt. Uh, chances of you getting hit are much less. Pneumatic tools, those are our air-powered tools. Um, 
There have been several cases, documented cases, where misuse of an uh, air nailer has resulted in death by somebody. These nails will penetrate the skull and they have killed people with improper use. So um, make sure that we use them properly. We know how to use them, that the safety is not overridden. Um, you should have to push down on the wood or whatever you're shooting into and pull the trigger. And if you pull the trigger without that uh, positive locking device down, uh, it, nothing should happen. Nothing should happen. Uh, but some of those get overridden for speed. Uh, people think you get more work out of it, you get it done faster. Um, you can't do that. It is a deadly situation, absolutely deadly. Pneumatic tools can penetrate the skull, they can penetrate bone. Um, there's even been documented cases where from a distance the framing of the um, structure was missed, went through the plywood and struck somebody in the heart and killed them. So here again, proper personal protective equipment must be worn, but you need to go even further and make sure that anybody on the other side of the wall of the floor that you're constructing, that there is nobody on the other side. Like I said, pneumatic tools can be very, very deadly. Equip tools with a device to keep fasteners from accidentally, getting in, accidentally being ejected. Uh, the screens protect the employees or just simply make sure that the employees are not in the area where they could get hurt if there is a misfire on that. Our fuel powered tools, um, store gas properly, uh, no plastic gas cans on a job site, unless they are plastic safety cans, which means they have self-closing lids on the top. Those, safe, those uh, gas cans that we use at our house for our own gas powered equipment, our lawn mowers, our weed whackers, things like that, uh, we cannot have those plastic gas cans on any job sites. Um, OSHA, that is an OSHA citation, and they have cited that. I have seen where they have cited that before. We all know that when we run out of gasoline, it doesn't matter what we're working with. It could be a generator, a lawnmower, a blower, or whatever the case may be. When we run out of gasoline, uh, we just walk over, grab the gas can, and start filling it right back up. Uh, every manufacturer will tell you to make sure you let that vehicle, let that machine cool down prior to refueling. We don't do it, but following manufacturer's instructions, we need to. We need to. Like I said, if something happens, OSHA gets on a job site, they see something like that, they will issue a citation for that. Ventilation, respiratory protection is needed. Are, where are we running these um, internal combustion engines? Uh, I worked for a contractor years and years and years ago, and uh, a couple years before I worked with them, they sent three people to the hospital. They were pouring a basement floor in a large commercial building, and they did not think about the fumes coming off of those power trowels that they were using in the basement. And three gentlemen were overcome with uh, carbon monoxide. Um, they made it, but they each spent the night in the hospital um, on 100% O2 to get that uh, carbon monoxide out of their system. So it doesn't take much um, carbon monoxide to uh, get you dizzy, get you a headache, you feel like you have the flu, and it can be deadly. Um, far too many people have died from inhaling too much carbon monoxide. So make sure you have plenty of ventilation in the area where you're using internal combustion engines, whether it's a blower, lawnmower, uh, power trowel, generators are really big on that. Our powder actuated tools, uh, you should not use these unless you've been trained by a factory representative from the company. Um, these have actual 22 caliber, 28 caliber, 32 caliber, whatever the case may be, um, loads in them to propel the nail into wood, concrete, or even steel. So you must be trained to use these. You must understand what you're shooting into and you must understand that what load that is to make sure that you're shooting into it. If you take a steel load and shoot it into wood, you're gonna go right through that wood and possibly kill somebody on the other side. 
So there's a lot, there is a lot to using a powder actuated tool. As far as the operation, they never get loaded until they are ready to be used. They are unloaded once they are not being used and they are stored once they are not being used. So it's 1130 in the morning and somebody yells at you said, hey, it's break time. You take that loaded powder actuated tool and you set it down on the floor where you were working or you set it on your, your scaffold where you were working and you go to lunch. Um, can't do that. You can't do that. You have to take that tool, unload it, put it back in the container, back in the box, and take that box back to a gang box or job trailer where it is secured. And we also, obviously, we must wear the suitable, the proper personal protective equipment when we are using that. It shoots very loud. It is a gunshot. So please, please, please be aware of that. So like I said, uh, select the appropriate powder level for the tool in the task, whether you're shooting into wood, steel, or concrete. Test the tool to make sure that the safety devices do work. Always inspect the tool and never, ever, ever use a defective tool. Make sure that that tool will work properly when you go to use it. What does the employer have to do to comply with all this? Well, first of all, training. And I know it sounds strange, um, but training must happen when it comes to hand and power tools. And it is, doesn't have to be much. People just have to understand what they need to do to make sure that when they grab that tool and use that tool, that the tool is going to work properly to protect them and also to protect others in the area. The inspection is very important. We must comply with the manufacturer's recommendations and how do we do that? Uh, here again, like I said before, we need to read the instructions. I know we don't do it, but we need to read the instructions. We need to understand what personal protective equipment we need to wear while we're using that tool we need to understand the dangers of that tool. How can that hurt us? And we need to be able to do and understand how to use it properly. The guards, the electrical, all of that, all of the components we need to understand and use properly. So here are a few things to identify hazards with. This is a sander. This is a, a sander, I believe. Um, and at the top, you can see where the wire uh, is exposed. When you see things like that, it, uh, it gets taken away. It gets tagged. It gets taken out of service. This is not good. This is going, could potentially hurt somebody with that wire moving back and forth. We've already cut through part of the insulation, the protection. There's just one more small level of that, and people can get hurt very seriously. Uh, removing the grounding prong, the third prong there, uh, like I said, electricity will find its easiest path to ground and we want to make sure it's through the wiring of the structure and not through us. So we want to make sure that all of those are intact and none of them are broken off. Uh, we talked about right angle grinders, metabos, removing the guard and also removing the handle. Can't do it. Can't do it. They all tell you keep the guard on and keep the handle on there. Um, table saws that are not, um, the guards have been removed and also uh, we should guard the belt that is driving the table saw. That's important to, to protect not only yourself from but somebody walking by, somebody stumbles, falls into that while the belt is turning, uh, that could give some serious, serious hand injuries. So now five quick questions, knowledge check. Which of the following is an example of an unsafe practice regarding the use of tools. Keeping cutting tools sharp, wearing eye and face protection while operating a grinder, using a screwdriver to carve or cut wood, following manufacturer's instructions when using a tool. So which is an unsafe practice? C, using a screwdriver to carve or cut wood. Number two, which term describes a tool that is powered by compressed air? Hydraulic? 
powder actuated, electrical, or pneumatic? Correct answer is D, pneumatic. Question number three. Which of the following actions may expose workers to electrical shock hazards and should be avoided? Removing the grounding pin on a three-prong plug, using double insulated tools, using a grounded adapter to accommodate a two-prong receptacle, or removing damaged tools from service and tagging them do not use? Correct answer is A, removing the grounding pin in a three-prong plug. Question number four, which of the following statements about guarding techniques is true? Guard the point of operation in running nip points and rotating parts of the tool. B, remove guard from tool while it is in use, then replace when the job is completed. C, adjust guard on abrasive wheel to allow maximum exposure of the wheel surface or D, wear PPE because guards will not protect operator from flying chips and sparks or moving parts of tools. The correct answer is A, guard the point of operation in running nip points and rotating parts of tools. Question number five, employers must satisfy all of the following requirements except provide PPE necessary to protect employees who are operating hand and power tools and are exposed to hazards, comply with OSHA training and inspection standards related to hand and power tools, determine which manufacturer's requirements and recommendations for a tool shall be followed or ignored, and D, do not use or permit the use of unsafe hand tools. Answer is C, determine which manufacturer's requirements and recommendations for a tool shall be followed or ignored. So when we talk about inspecting tools prior to each and every use, these are the things that we have actually pulled off of job sites throughout Northwest Ohio. A drift pin being used by an iron worker with a big crack right down the middle of it. Unacceptable. Hits this the wrong way, splits it, falls apart, falls below him, poor gentleman or lady below him gets hurt because of that. These are the things that when we see things like this, we need to stop, we need to get a new one, this needs to go in the recycling bin and get taken care of, taken off the job site. Our hammers that we use on a regular basis. Cracked handle, loose head, should not be used but yet this was taken off of a job site here in Northwest Ohio. Same thing with this ham hammer too. Cracked handle, unacceptable, cannot be used on job sites. So these are the things prior to each and every use, we must inspect this to make sure that what we use is not gonna hurt ourselves or it's not gonna hurt anybody else working nearby us. This blade was actually, came apart while in use. And according to the people that used it, although it looks bad, it wasn't in use. It, they should have gotten many, many, many more hours out of this than what they did. But the center came apart. Luckily, the guard was in place, everything was good. Nobody got hurt. But these are the things that could happen. If the guard had not been in place, where would this have gone? Who knows? Who knows? And then we have the Metabo, the right angle grinder that was used on a job site. It has a six inch disc on it. When it was designed and built for a four inch. So the guard is off, the handle is off. But something even more important here I want everybody to understand. This says maximum speed, 8,600 revolutions per minute, 8,600 RPMs. <clears throat> the Metabo on the side says 9,000 RPMs. So the tool is spinning faster than what the disc is rated at. This thing could have very easily flown apart and who knows how many people it could have hurt 
had this thing shattered and broken apart. The something I didn't touch on earlier, but I do want to talk about now is uh, double insulated tools. A double insulated tool is a tool that is a plastic case. The motor inside is isolated from that case. It's on, mounted on little rubber grommets, little rubber washers. So that if something happens to that motor, that electrical charge is not transmitted through the handle, through the case itself. It's double insulated. So the double insulated tool will have a square around a square. It will also have, <clears throat> it will only have two, two pins, a hot and a neutral on the cord. So you will not see a three pin ground, you won't see a grounding prong on a double insulated tool. If you don't see a grounding prong, make sure it is double insulated. Like I said, simply look at the label and it will be a square around a square in indicating a double insulated tool. This tool also was taken off of a job site simply because it had a bad wire on it, a bad cord. So these are the things that we must do to be able to keep ourselves safe. Then we talked about the Hilti gun. This, this is the Hilti gun. It is out of service, no longer to be used. But these are what, they're powder actuated tools that must be locked when not used, unloaded when not used, and put away so that nobody can use them, especially those who are not qualified to use these. When we talk about the shots, these are our three different colors that indicate metal, wood, or steel that we're shooting into. And this is how you can tell. If you leave these on laying around on the ground, rumor has it that OSHA will also cite you for these, whether it's completely blown out, like, well, most of these are, or not. So we have to be aware of that also. Make sure that we do what we dispose of these. However, Hilti or Ramset, whoever it is, make sure we dispose of these the way that the manufacturer tells us to dispose of these. Thank you for participating in this training, Hand and Power Tools. Stay tuned. There's a quick video for you to watch, and there are some more questions to answer. Please be safe. Thank you.